actually cheaper than the, than the conventional. It's actually on interest rate. Really? Wow. So I, um, yeah, I'm... Yay. Yeah, yay. <laughs> now the fun begins? It is 3 o'clock. We'll call this meeting of the ECUA to order. Uh, Ms. Campbell is going to lead us in the prayer and pledge, and we invite you to join us. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for reminding us to never take any day for granted. Be with us this, this body today as we go about our duties and help us to make right decisions for all we serve. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. <clears throat> Chairman Benson? Yes. Um, we need to take roll. Please do. Okay. Mr. Perkins? Here. Mr. Stevens? Chairman Benson? Here. Mr. Williams? Here. And Ms. Campbell? Here. Perfect. Thank you. The next item is the adoption of the agenda. Uh, does it, uh, anyone have any additions um, I, I, to the agenda? Ms. Chair, Madam Chairman? Yes. Um, I'd like on um, somewhere on the agenda, I guess we could put it on new business, a uh, discussion of uh, Roy Street high bacteria counts. Uh, there's an article in the paper today that there's high bacteria counts down there, and I want to make sure that we look at the study. If there's any way we can help, that we help, make sure our system is fine. Okay. Um, you know, I know we spend a lot of money downtown, but I, uh, you know, I know I know we don't have any control over storm water or private laterals or anything like that. But I want to make sure that our our system is fine, and that we have either die tested or inspected them. Or if we have not, let's do it. And if we find anything. Let's take care of it because Bruce Beach has the potential to be a really nice feature of downtown Pensacola. Like a lot of really nice cities have a, a common public beach area. I think that I'm really excited about that. So I'd like to see us participate and help and move that forward any way we can. So I don't know where you'd like to add it under we either can, 13 or 14, but either one is fine with me. Let's do it under unfinished business, okay. um, Mr. Perkins. Okay. Um, we'll put it under unfinished business if we Thank can. You. Thank you. Um, okay. uh, any other additions to the agenda? Seeing none. Yes. Okay. Let's put it on new business. Did you hit your speaker button by any chance? No, I mean your speaker How's button on, on the program. I have, did not. Okay. We, we're, we're streamlining that a little bit, so I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, so we'll add budget discussion to, um, let's put that under new business if we might. Uh, anyone else want to add anything to the agenda? Okay, we'll entertain a motion to um, adopt the agenda as amended. been moved by Ms. Perkins, seconded by uh, Ms. Ms. Campbell, seconded by Mr. Perkins. Please vote. And it's adopted. Uh, the next item is public hearings, and we have none. 
We then come to open forum. Uh, and before I call, we have two speakers today on open forum. Before I call on them, uh, Mr. Woody's going to brief us about speakers um, on with this existing program, if you will do that, Mr. Woody. Uh, as, as you know, and for those in the, in the audience who may not know, we've uh, recently added some new software to help us with the process by which we put together the agenda, present the information, and make it available on our website as well. Um, there is a feature of the software that we haven't been using consistently, so I want to touch base on, on a couple items to be sure that we're aware of them so that they are available for your uh, convenience. Uh, and those have to do with uh, speaking. As you know, since we have a new system and the lights are not up near the stock, um, previously that was the means by which the chair would look and identify who was asking to speak. Actually, we have the, actually, we have the availability to do that within the system. So I wanted to point out a couple uh, key features. Number one, if you want to speak on a particular item, you have to be sure that your cursor is on the item that is listed as active. That's the one that has the yellow bar over the top of it. So at, at the present time, we're on open forum. So as long as your cursor, you've clicked on open forum, where it's considered active, then you go to the right side of your page. There are several uh, tabs. One in the middle says speakers. If you click speakers, then you will uh, be provided an opportunity. There's a blue box that then will appear. It says request to speak. Uh, just for demonstration purposes, I'll click on it. Uh, that's your opportunity to uh, click on an item if that's what you wish to speak on. Uh, the chair has the ability to um, call on you on the order in which that you made a request, or certainly they can, they can do that out of order if they, they feel the need to do so. Um, but uh, the chair has a feature that the rest of us don't in that when a individual starts to do their speaking, uh, she can uh, erase or click a little, little off to the right. There's a little trash can there. You can delete your space, uh, which allows you to then click on request it again if you want to speak a second time or a third time or a fifth time, whatever the case may be, provided the chair uh, eliminates you once you've begun your you're speaking before. So uh, that should be uh, a way that we'll make sure that nobody is missed and that we're uh, kind of consistent with the way that process uh, goes. So again, the, the most important thing is you must be on, uh, have a yellow bar on the item that is currently active in order for you to request to speak on the item that is active. You can, uh, you can cheat and go ahead and, and if there's an item on the agenda you particularly want to speak on, you can click on it and ask to be a speaker early. Uh, but that won't happen, in, uh, and the uh, chair won't see that until that item becomes active. Thank you, and we'll, we'll see if it works out today, but I think this is a good feature. We've had a problem with, with that in the past, and I think it was user error, so I'm still getting used to it. Um, thank you, Mr. Woody. Uh, we have two speakers who wish to address us in open forum. Um, both have been here before, so you, you know the drill. The first one is Dr. Gloria Horning. 210 South DeVillers. Uh, Dr. Horning, you're recognized. Um, um, time I was Ten years ago, I read the mission statement. And at the time, the chair, still ten years ago, said, yes, we should be reminded of that mission statement. Y'all really need to be reminded of that mission statement. I've been sending you, the chair, and the former engineer, and now Mr. Woody, pictures and videos and pictures and videos and pictures and videos for seven years. Every time it rains, we have an SSO, an inch of rain. Now, I'm going to address those bilaterals because this is what I do. I'm not an English major. The bacteria levels coming off properties, not out of drains, is 25,000. You know what the EPA limit is? Anybody? No. 70. Seven zero. Now, when 
I've been working with the city for six years to get this report. And through the organization I'm with, we got pro bono scientists to help us do all this testing. At the first meeting, which I know at least one member of this board was at, and I believe Mr. Woody was, I was presented to the city, he showed the intercaucus levels again. Crazy. So when you say, we want to be involved, you knew about it. And it's also in a consent form on the FDLP, FDEP website. I look at this stuff because my community is drowning in human waste. The, the sewage, and it's human waste, we tested it, is coming off the properties. The properties where they're testing, and it can be as high as 25,000. You go into a ball game, you're walking in it. So, for years, I've asked y'all to address it. I have yet to see my representative once in my community, not once to look at what's going on and how those storm drains and sewer lines and everything else is connected. During Hurricane Sally, I couldn't even get a response to come clean all the condoms, tampons, human waste, visible human waste, all over our community. You know who finally took care of it? The people that lived there? We cleaned it up. And then, by default, Mayor Robinson stepped in. And I'll tell you what he said, because I have the email. Next time, contact the organization that's responsible. And I said, look at the chain. It's our water, people. It's our health. And y'all just keep kicking this down the road. And now you've got multi-billion dollar move-ins. And you haven't addressed this in decades. And let me see what you said. Um, um, I'm not going to. It's a serious problem, and we have not given it the focus we need. August 2021, Lois Benson. Come on, people. This is the health of our, our, our community. And people are down there in the water because they're not putting up warning signs. This is the second report, and the numbers are just incredible. And again, they're not all coming from stormwater drains. They're coming off property that's holding the water. And I have a good idea where it's coming from because of the way it's flowing out, because that's what I do. But we'll work on that. I'll work on it. My organization will work on it. The Environmental Protection Network and their lawyers will work on it. You've come up and destroyed the tan yard by not doing your due diligence, kicking the can down the road. You should be embarrassed. Uh, Mr. Woody. The East UA does provide sanitary sewer service in this community and has a primary responsibility for maintaining and operating that wastewater collection and conveyance and treatment system. Uh, the problems you discuss are multifold and have been created over decades. Yes. A and we are trying to work with the community to 
make corrections to past problems in a much shorter time than they were created. Um, the issues you discuss can Dr. Horning. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll entertain a question in a moment if I can have just a few minutes to finish. Um, the, the sources can be from the multiple locations. Uh, first and foremost of the concern that you're trying to point out are defects in uh, the public conveyance system. Uh, there are all, but in reality, there's also defects in the private portions of the system that connect to our uh, collection system. Uh, there are also still septic tanks throughout uh, the drainage area, uh, and part of the reason that we make investments in septic to sewer conversions. And uh, although I know you've done some DNA testing, there is a mixture of not only human waste, but also uh, animal waste as well. No, sir. As a community, well. No, sir. Dr. Yeah. Horning. Uh, you, you're, you're, Dr. Your primary, Horning. primary focus far and away is certainly the human waste. I, I don't know. Don't, it was don't debate that at all. independent scientist yeah. at University of Central Okay. I, I'm not, not trying to refute that. Yeah, oh, I'm not trying to refute I'm not trying to refute it. I'm just saying there's Dr. There's Horning. Madam Chairman, if she's not going to let the gentleman speak, well, why don't we take it up at the end where, where we, we have it on the agenda? But if she's not going to even listen and let him speak, then Y'all there's no sense coming. in him trying to speak. Yeah. Thank you. You're, Mr. Woody, I really appreciate it. Dr. Horn, you are not recognized. You have had your five minutes. We, we will have another opportunity for you to speak. He is trying to address the issues that you speak of. Please. At the suggestion of Mr. Perkins, we will defer that and we will have a, a board discussion on this issue uh, on the agenda where, where he has brought it up. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate um, your remarks. Um, the next speaker is Christine Pino. Ms. Pino, you are recognized. And if the green light is not on, please turn it on and uh, give us your name and your street address. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Pino. I live at 2A Paleo Road. And um, you picked the right person to test a new system. I am totally computer literate, illiterate. So I don't even see a yellow button here. Uh, no, you're fine. You're, uh, you're broadcasting. You're fine. Okay. Um, I am here hope for the, hopefully for the last time um, to address the reinstatement of the trash collection in the alleyway between Lemhurst and Paleo. This has been going on for two years. Um, I own 25% of the property that the alleyway goes over. And uh, I have just been advised yesterday after asking one of my neighbors that isn't even involved had told me the day before yesterday that they tried to give her a letter talking about the reinstatement. Um, I never got a letter. So, or it wasn't a letter, it was a notice. It was a notice from the code. No, it was from ECUA, I think. I think it was from ECUA. And um, in any case, I do not have a problem, let me say up front. I don't care whether they collect it in the front or the back. My house has ready access to either way. Um, let me just say, I am going to leave my trash can in front. Um, after all the things that have, I've been victimized with over this for the last two years, I'm uncomfortable putting it on the back alley. But that's, that's fine with me. And I just want to know, you to know up front, I don't have a problem with it being reinstated. I never have. My issue right now is the discussions for the reinstatement, the most recent um, discussions. I know that twice some of the folks had come and talked to you on the board. Um, I came the month afterwards twice to clarify 
some of the things that were said that were inaccurate and untruthful. Um, this is the third time that I've been here. And I'm here now because nobody, even though I own 25% and 19 other people own 4% each, I have not been included in these discussions at all. I ha I, I'm, uh, nobody, neither, no, nobody from ECUA or nobody from the neighborhood that have been doing whatever they did have, have included me. My neighbor told me the other day that some kind of, everybody was, had signed something. I would like to see what they signed. My bottom line is I own 25% for 13 years that I've lived here. I have paid to get that 25% regravel, except ECUA did it two years ago, and I appreciate that. The trucks did some real damage, real ruts. They literally had to stop and, and then go slow over the ruts. On my part, I don't know about the rest of the, the area. But my concern, <coughs> bottom line, and we can make this very easy, who is, I don't know what the waiver said. If it was a waiver, they signed, quote, a piece of paper. I don't know what it said. I would like a copy of it. Uh, but I would like to know who is going to pay for the um, repairs of the road. That's my whole question. Sure. And uh, Mr. Woody, did you want to address that? Uh, you're well familiar with the uh, with the area, and maybe not others in our audience. So just I'll very briefly describe it so there's some context. Um, there's an existing alley between the streets of Lemhurst and Haleo. Um, on the south end, this alleyway connects uh, directly to a public right-of-way that runs east-west. I'm sorry, I forget the name of the street off the top of my head. <laughs> um, at the north end, it, uh, it uh, makes a turn to the uh, west and connects on to uh, Lemhurst. And uh, that is through a portion of property that uh, you are an owner of. That, there is an easement over that section of the alleyway that was dedicated for public access directly from your property. That exists in a slightly different form than the balance of the alleyway, uh, which runs through all of your neighbors to the east. That was all dedicated as a part of their... Um, uh, plat for for that road. Uh, there were some discussions with those folks because their easement exists in a different form, was created in a different form. It's probably a more accurate way to say it. I don't want to be speaking out of term. I'm not the attorney either, either so please speak up if I, you know, want to correct me, Robert. Um, so we did have some conversations with, uh, with uh, those folks who are concerned about uh, if we were to access or continue to access the alleyway to provide services that the uh, trees and limbs be cut at an adequate height so that we can uh, pass through the area and our equipment can function underneath the tree canopy in the area, and uh, concerns about the condition of the alleyway as, as well. Uh, that was, and that the alleyway be kept clear. So uh, the terms and conditions of uh, an agreement you're talking about were just an acknowledgement of those issues and the adjacent property owner's responsibilities to provide those services not ECUA, uh, because you are not a, a party to that particular easement area. It, it wasn't created in the same form. That's the reason why you weren't involved directly in any of those discussions. You're not a party to those uh, to those agreements. Um, there's already a, a dedicated easement for the portion that comes through to your property. We have been providing those services for many years in past. It certainly would be desirable for us and easier for us to pick up off the street but under the terms and conditions we reached that they would maintain that back uh, back alleyway, we did come to an agreement that we would resume service in the alley. Did sure. you wish to ask him any questions about what he I said? I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Am I going to have to pay or am I not? And if I am not, uh, who's going to pay? 
I mean, I'm not talking about coming in every year. It went 13 years sure. since I've lived there. And um, the ruts were there. And I kept filling it in, obviously, not as well as you did. It's two years down the line, and it looks all right. So are you saying that I'm still responsible? Uh, These other people all had the privilege of signing a waiver mm -hmm. and a letter from two years ago said, so, I, I, who's going to pay? Mm -hmm. tell, t just tell me that, please. So, Ms. Pino, if I could. I'm sorry. L let me address the attorney so he can talk okay. to you about what specifically, if that's okay, the, the um, agreement is. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Ms. Pino. Um, short answer, you're not going to pay. They're going to pay. Thank you. We can end the discussion the and agreement. excuse me for butting in here. That's okay. The agreement's called a maintenance agreement. I'm going to be glad to get it to you. I'll get you a copy of it. Um, and it's an agreement between the ECUA and the, those owners. And it basically says two things. One, they're not going to obstruct our access. If they do, we're not going to run the trucks down there because there was a prior issue with some vegetation and some parking issues. So it was an acknowledgement by that group who wanted this service continued to re resume that they would monitor, they would police their own. So that's the first thing we needed to establish. And the second was that the condition, the, as you said, the condition of the easement in front of your property is, is pretty well done and maintained either by you or ECA previously or both. Um, but their area, the remainder of their area, has some suspect areas, although right now it's passable, was they put the obligation on that group to maintenance the easement in its entirety. Uh, and so um, there was, there was because we were not coming to you to ask for you to contribute, and we understood that your position is, as you stated earlier, I don't think anyone, at least I never misunderstood your position. I understood where you were on it. Um, but we weren't going to ask anything of you because we didn't need anything of you and certainly wouldn't ask you to pay for maintenance of their easement. That's why you're not a party to the agreement. But they are, and certainly we'll get you a copy so you can review it. So what you're saying, so who's going to pay for the era, my 25%? Somebody, are the other owners or are the, you all? The, the easement in its entirety is subject to the maintenance agreement, whereby the owner group that is being serviced is agreeing to pay for the maintenance. What does that mean? Okay, all of them. They, they will split the fee, me. not no. you, not you. They will split the fee. They're parties to the agreement. You're not. For their part or and for yours. my part? And for all of it. For all of it. The whole thing. Yeah. You people are wonderful. Yeah. We, <laughs> you know, for two we, years. We understood I've it been... wasn't servicing your house, and so it wasn't fair, even though it passes by a portion of your property, it wasn't fair to ask you to maintenance uh, a portion of roadway that serviced their properties. So we, we didn't even think to ask you to pay for the maintenance. So um, that's why you weren't part of the agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Case for coming, Ms. Dino. I appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your cooperation in this process. And Ms. Campbell, you had a speaker request. Is okay. Yes. Um, I have no more pink slips. Uh, there will be a second um, open forum, and you're welcome to stay and be in the second one. Uh, the next item is presentations. <coughs> um, and the first item is Recycle Star. And Mr. Williams, if you will pick a lucky winner. One, two, number 12. Number 12. And the winner is Anthony MacArthur. Um, so he will get all of the bells and whistles and our sincere thanks for his extraordinary efforts at recycling. The other people were Deborah Bowen. Barbara Murray, Alexis Dickey, Lena Murphy, Walter Gay, Ernestine Tomasoni, Laurie Tackett, Debbie Bossom, Anthony Ross, Lacey McShane, Larry Rowe, Anthony MacArthur, Christopher Maxwell, Ms. Andy Shutt, and Larry Legg. I'm sorry, I re repeated the winner's name, didn't I? Uh, Sylvia Sims, George and Betty Bennett, Wendra Lawrence, Susan Stubbins, Adrian Smiley, and Kenneth Shaw. Thanks to all of them. Uh, the next item is a presentation by Munis uh, Florida Municipal Safety Excellence Initiative, and Mr. Woody, if you would introduce them. Uh, tonight we have visiting with us, uh, this afternoon I guess I should say, uh, Mr. Sam Slay. He's a risk and safety consultant with Florida Municipal Insurance Trust. Uh, we have been, uh, we are, we, 
are getting ready to be presented an award from uh, FMIT for a certificate of safety recognition. And I would ask that Sam kind of explain the criteria in which we went through to win this recognition. Thank you, Sam. Let me make sure I can get everything to work up here. About uh, two years ago, the Florida League of Cities and with the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust began a program called the Safety Excellence Initiative. Uh, that program was to create a kind of a baseline policy protocol system for our cities, counties, and utilities and that kind of thing. So with that, we offered that up to our members. It was voluntary. It wasn't, none of it was required, but we would support that. And we embarked on that after talking to your executive team. And I've been working with Risk and Safety, uh, Mark and uh, Doug for the past few months. And actually before that, when David Wheeler was uh, with you and he and I uh, kind of co-taught some defensive driving training. So we've been continuing that even before we had the program. And I'm happy to report today that uh, we scored your program. You made a, you, well, let me back up. You only needed to make a 65 to reach the first level level one, uh, and then the following year it was supposed to be 75, and then the following year 85. We weren't looking for perfection to get started. Uh, but as uh, Mark put the packages together, it turns out that you actually scored a 94. So you got an A, you know, it's like school, you got kind of got an A with that. So we're pretty excited. So I'm here to authorize or actually award you your certificate of level one completion for the Emerald Coast Utility Authority under the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust Safety Excellence Initiatives. As I talked to Doug and uh, Mark earlier, it's not a final point. It's, it's something we want to build on. It just kind of lays that foundation. We have to push it to leadership and culture in the organization where safety is the, uh, the duty of the newest employee or the oldest employee. And if we can do that, then a sidebar of that, you get your premiums lower, but more importantly, you keep your employees safe, and that's primarily what we want to do. So I don't know if uh, Mr. Woody wants to be in the picture on this one, but if he does, we'll try to get a picture and award this and mark. And I think this award goes to all of our employees who made this, this record. And thank you for coming here to present that. <laughs> Sam, thank you. I appreciate this. Uh, we all do, as a matter of fact. This is a very good award. Uh, those of you that know me in my past, I've been in roles where I've done very similar things of what Sam's presented with us with this award. I uh, worked with the Certification Institute uh, for a former employer. So I knew the basic ground principle of all of these programs and what was needed. And so I was able to quickly go through a lot of the things that we needed, update forms, update policies, procedures, making sure that we had the right things in them and get that information to them. So uh, again, it was just a, a good pleasure. It was kind of an interesting uh, take me back one day and, and know that the safety aspect is really important here at ECUA. Uh, I came on board in May of last year in the safety and training role, and I hope to make some good improvements uh, with it all. So if you all ever have any questions with safety, please, uh, my door is wide open. I tell everybody, you have to excuse my voice. I uh, was doing an OSHA 10-hour class this morning, so <laughs> I did a lot of talking already today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chairman Benson, may I, may yes. I make a comment? Yes, please do. No, I would, ju I would just like to follow up. Um, as, as I'm currently, Sam, as I'm currently um, dealing with insurance renewals and premiums right now, and of course, first and foremost, you know, the safety of our people is, is, is paramount. Um, and then as a sidebar, as I'm looking at this budget, um, and uh, we're, all, we're all looking for ways to, to cut costs, reduce costs, and be efficient, the safety record is huge. And, and I want to thank Director Woody and the other department heads for driving that point home with our employees and our coworkers because 
what what a what a significant difference a a um, a and a less safe company's premiums are as opposed to a, a safe company's. It it translates to thousands of dollars a month, which ends up being tens or thousands of dollars, hundreds thousand dollars a year, translated in real savings to uh, to ECUA and uh, and the residents. So that's. I, 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 that that's been my whole day today. Was looking at insurance renewals. So this really drove, really spoke to me today. Uh, yes, I wish I had a ninety-four percent rating at some of my companies. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Stevens. Okay. Uh, now let me ask you: Did you hit your speaker button? Because your name didn't come up. It's okay. I just want to make sure that I'm doing it right. Okay. It, it's okay. I just want to make sure that it's not. Uh, my error. Okay. The next item is approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting of March 22nd, 2020. Um, does anyone have any additions, changes, corrections to the minutes? If not, we'll entertain a motion for approval. It's been moved by Ms. Campbell and seconded by Mr. Perkins. Please vote. And it passes five to zero. Thank you. The next item is the report of the Citizens Advisory Committee led by Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell, you are recognized. The Citizen Advisory Council met on April 19th. I should remember that day. It's my husband's birthday. <laughs> At three o'clock, uh, all members present with the exception of uh, Laurie Murphy, David Gaines, and Chuck Kimball. The fiscal year 2023 operating budget presentations were done for finance, administration, and board members, human resource and administration services, shared services, information technology, and the customer services. We did not do the fiscal year 2023 CIP budget presentation. It will be next month. Item G was adoption of general resolution GR 22-41, a general resolution authorizing the renewal and extension of the annual electric motor and rewind service agreement with Gulf Coast Electric Motor Service, Inc. Motion was made by Mr. Perkins and second by Mr. Stevens, and the board voted in favor 9-0. Item G2 was adoption of general resolution GR 22-44, a general resolution authorizing acceptance an award of contract authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with Western Oil Fields Supply Company doing business as Rain for Rent for the annual contract for weekly bi-monthly rental of diesel bypass pumps and storage tanks at the unit prices bid. Motion was made by Mr. Brown, second by Ms. Ritz, and board approved 9-0 in favor. Item G3 was adoption of general resolution number 22-46, a general resolution authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with Evans Contracting Inc. for the Water Service Renewal 2022 Annual Contract Project and provide an effective date. The motion was made by Ms. Benson, seconded by Mr. Stevens, and the board voted 9-0 in favor. Item G4 was adoption of general resolution GR 22-49, a resolution authorizing the purchase of a four-ton wall-mounted HVAC units for the Emerald Coast Utilities Authority Central Water Reclamation Facility, the Motor Control Center buildings utilizing the National Cooperative Purchasing Alliance through engineered cooling services. Motion was made by Ms. Benson, seconded by Mr. Brown, and the board adopted General Resolution 9-0 in favor. I'd like to move items 2 through 5 for approval. It has been moved. Is there a second? been moved and seconded by Mr. Stevens. Uh, did anyone wish to speak on this issue? Interesting problem. Um, if not, please vote. And it passes five to zero. That concludes my report. 
And thank you for, uh, for that, Ms. Campbell, and for all the deliberations by the CAC. Um, let me, as long as we're dealing with this program, let me mention one possible problem. I'm, I'm allowed to see the names of the speakers until a motion comes up. And once the motion comes up, I can't see the names of the speakers. And typically, under Robert's rules, you have a motion and a second before you have discussion. So we may want to revisit that sequencing so that you can have discussion after, after the motion. So this is a work in progress. Okay, the next item is the consent agenda. Uh, and I'm going to read each one as we have started doing. And then after each one, we will have a brief explanation by Mr. Woody. If anyone wants, wants to pull it for further discussion, you may do so at that time. Item A is adoption of general resolution number GR22-45, a general resolution authorizing the executive director to enter into an interlocal agreement with the Scambia County for the Maple Leaf Estate subdivision water main upgrades and providing an effective date. Mr. Woody. Uh, Maple Leaf Estate subdivision uh, is a, originally a private subdivision that privately maintained water and sewer systems. Uh, I'm pleased to say that over a period of time we've uh, worked with them and negotiated and came up to an agreement for an, creating an MSBU, Municipal Service Benefit Unit, in order to uh, upgrade those services to something public that we would maintain. Uh, what is included for this resolution is a interlocal agreement uh, that establishes the uh, terms and conditions of that MSBU with the county. I see no speakers on this. We will move to item B. General resolution number GR22-47, a general resolution authorizing the executive director to transfer funds and increase purchase order number 20220278 with Green South Solutions, LLC, for Class B biosolids land application services from 300000 to 420000 Mr. Woody. Uh, this resolution would provide an extension of an existing agreement to allow us with enough funds to cover costs associated with taking la uh, Class B biosolids to a uh, land application uh, program. We've been doing this during a period of time that uh, one of our two dryers has been out of service due to a major uh, overhaul. Uh, at the time that uh, um, we're an organization that always likes to have uh, backup plans and and uh, some series of uh, redundancies. So uh, in the same way that we have two dryers at the, at the system, uh, we also want to be sure that while one of them is down that we had a backup plan. Um, although this may, uh, although we're asking for approval for the funds at the end of the year, uh, in all likelihood, uh, we'll have that second dryer up uh, back in service here in a matter of just a few more weeks. Um, Jerry uh, Piscopo and his group have been working really hard uh, to finish that project. Okay, I see no speakers on that. Thank you, Mr. Woody. Uh, item C is adoption of general resolution number GR22-48, a general resolution authorizing the acceptance of bid and awarding of a contract, authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with Evans Contracting, Inc. for $1,129,145.43 to replace antiquated water main CIP number RW0030, Doris Avenue, Powell Street, Rose Avenue, and Figland Avenue water main upgrades, authorizing the transfer and use of funds. Mr. Woody. Uh, this project has been in the works for a while to replace antiquated uh, water mains, water mains we've had difficulties with uh, due to uh, breaks. Originally, this project was estimated to be about an $800,000 project, and we, as we've been facing, we've had increasing costs due to uh, um, problems with availability of materials as well as uh, contractors. Uh, we originally bid it and did not receive any bids. Uh, we advertised it again, and we did receive uh, two bids for the project. It did come in at the price discussed, the $1.1 uh, in the current market, we believe that it's still a, a, a good price that needs to be proceeded on and will help uh, replace uh, extensive uh, water lines in this neighborhood. And I see no speakers. Item D is adoption of general resolution number GR22-50, 
a general resolution authorizing the executive director to execute a contract with Gator Boring and Trenching Inc. for the mobile <coughs> highway at Bayou Marcus Creek 12 inch HDPE water main project and provide an effective date. Mr. Woody. Uh, you know, on March 3rd of this year, we had a 12 inch water main crossing underneath the creek at this location, uh, Bayou Marcus Creek, uh, underneath Mobile Highway, it ruptured. Uh, crews were able to uh, quickly resolve the issue and re re regain service by isolating valves on either side of the creek. However, it remains in that uh, status at the present time. That crossing is pretty vital to make sure that we maintain adequate pressures and volumes for the area to provide the level of service that uh, we wish to provide. So we believe it's imperative to uh, replace this um, failed section uh, right away. So we did advertise, or we did solicit, I should say, uh, two quotes to do this on an, an expedited basis. And the uh, low bidder was Gator Boring for 143000 and I see no speakers. Uh, item E is adoption of general resolution number GR22-51, general resolution authorizing the acceptance of bid from Robertson Underground Utility in the amount of $303,450 for CIP project CR0023, Sorrento Bauer Utility Relocation, and authorizing the transfer of project funds. Mr. Woody. Uh, this is a project we're doing in conjunction with the uh, okay. FDOT. They are adding uh, turn lanes and reconstructing a portion of that intersection. Uh, we did advertise this project, received two bids, and are recommending the low bidder of uh, Roberson Underground uh, to complete some realignment and relocation of water lines uh, in conjunction with this FDOT project. Ms. Campbell. You know when this project will come <coughs> Um, I'm probably going to lean on Stacy to give me more specific date information. That's not a date I'm familiar with off the top of my head, and he may not either if it hasn't been awarded yet. So. Ms. Campbell, can you move the mic a little bit closer to you? It just wasn't picking up on the video very well. You Your voice now? wasn't picking okay. up very good. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Campbell. Uh, could you re uh, repeat the question, please. I'm sorry, you were asking you about the You have a timeline for this project? Um, it, not handy, but I will get that from our staff and get that to you. Uh, I'm not sure if there's going to be a delay due to the uh, DOT work uh, and when all that will be coordinated, so I need to find out and I'll get back with you as well as the rest of the board members an update. If they can do it not in the summer months, would be fantastic. <laughs> that road is very dangerous. We, uh, yes, ma'am, I agree. Uh, We'll, we'll try to do what we can, but uh, sometimes we, we don't have any control over the schedule because it is uh, coordinated with uh, through DOT. That sometimes dictate, dictates when the work needs to be done. Just let them know that we pray that they don't do this in the middle of summer. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other? I, I see no other speakers, so thank you, you Mr. Speak. Hayden. Uh, the next item is item... F, adoption of general resolution number GR22-52, general resolution authorizing the conceptual approval to abandon certain existing utility easements within Ellison Industrial Park and to declare the easements no longer useful, necessary, or profitable in the operation of the utility systems of the Emerald Coast Utilities Authority, approving and concurring in the findings of the executive director, declaring the easements to be surplus and providing an effective date. There's a developer that's proposing to build a warehouse just a stone's throw from this building, just uh, southwest of us here. Uh, the, vacant, the lot is currently vacant and contains a number of uh, water and sewer easements, fire hydrants, and some other features that are shown on Exhibit A. Uh, as proposed, the developer would cut and cap those water and sewer mains where their building footprint would encroach and uh, make whatever improvements as uh, required through development review to serve that property. So the request here is to abandon mains that are currently uh, not in use uh, in order for development of the proposed lot adjacent to uh, our facility. Mr. Stevens. Mr. Woody, on, and I think I've probably asked this question before uh, on, on a similar subject matter, but, but I'm a, when these become abandoned and become surplus, are we putting these out 
to like the, the, the uh, general public to bid on these, to sell these at the highest and best price? Um, I think there's probably two, two answers to that. Uh, I think the, your line of questioning has to do if we're abandoning uh, a piece of real property uh, if that's the case, or abandoning uh, a uh, easement in which we own real title to it, right? Uh, then those are advertised, and the adjacent property owners or others can can bid on that. This particular instance is a little bit different than that. We have easements located across an existing property, and all we're abandoning is the easements in the infrastructure that we own inside that easement. Uh, the developer will cut and cap their responsibility the water lines and sewer lines that uh, aren't needed to serve their, their development. We're just abandoning an easement. So we're actually relieving ourselves of a little bit of uh, infrastructure yeah. ownership and maintenance. And, and typically, if we have easements located to the adjacent property owner, do we reach out to the property owner and kind of give them like first right of refusal, like this is a? Uh, if it's an easement, uh, then generally it goes back to the property from which the easement was created. Okay. If it was uh, on a property line, then it may go back half and half to adjacent property owners. If it's wholly within the existing property, then depending based on research of the ownership and encumbrances, it'll go back to the property owner from okay. which it came. From which it came. Right. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, Mr. Perkins. Yes, and also this, this um, the only thing this infrastructure services is that one property there. And so they're creating new new infrastructure, and we'll have access through easements to new infrastructure. So we're not nobody's losing anything. It's actually improving the system, and it's probably saving us money. It's, yeah. it's not like it's other other areas that it serves. Um, and Miss Campbell, yeah, I was going to say, Kevin, this in like an alleyway where they're we're abandoning, and it goes either way. It's more like there's abandoned easements underneath the property. Mm -hmm. That nobody's using and so they're gonna put in easements that they and us will use so they're actually doing us a favor I think yeah. but it, it begs the question there is some value associated with that easement and I, and I don't know if there's a way to capitalize on that value because that value will accrue to the property owner um, if I own an easement next to my property that the public has access to and that easement is abandoned, my property is enhanced by that. It would be interesting to look into whether there's some way to create a value, uh, not on this case, but in the future. And you there, probably know more about that there than There is I a do. way. It's called uh, dimini diminution of value, but I would guarantee you in this case it wouldn't be worth the uh, mm. getting the – or, and Robert could speak to that, probably wouldn't be worth getting the diminution of value. Uh, it would probably end up costing us more money than it would be worth. Did you w wish to opine, Mr. Beasley? Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, um, Ms. Campbell concluded with the, uh, with the remarks that I would have, which is in this case, um, the proposed propose, diminution value appraisals are pretty complicated to prepare and take a good bit of field work and I'm not sure that you know you don't, you don't usually go about them unless the value um, that you're trying to capture is 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 pretty extensive and in this case it, it would be close um. yeah yeah in 40 years I've done two okay and <laughs> this would not be a case you'd want yeah. thank you you're welcome Okay, um, I, I see no other speakers on that issue. Uh, the next item is G, Adoption of General Resolution Number GR22-53, a general resolution authorizing the executive director to enter into a contract with the highest bidder for the transfer of surplus Emerald uh, Coast Utilities Authority real property located on North 57th Avenue that has been declared no longer necessary, useful, or profitable in the operation of the utility systems of the Emerald Coast Utilities Authority. Mr. Woody. Uh, this example is more closely related to the question that uh, Board Member Stevens asked earlier. Here we are uh, asking the Board to consider a release of real property that we own. In this particular case, we did advertise it. We received three bids from three different property um, or 
three different individuals who are interested in the property. Um, Mr. Hawk uh, bid $2,100, Mr. McClug bid $9,000, and a uh, group called Law Enterprises bid $2,000. We're recommending that we sell the property to Mr. Klung for, as the highest bidder for, in the amount of $9,000. See no speakers on this, so we will move to item H. Adoption General Resolution GR 22-54, a general resolution authorizing the purchase of certain real property located at 5080 Mobile Highway to serve as the relocation site of a Char Bar lift station, LS 107, and authorizing the transfer and use of funds. Mr. Woody. Uh, this is a property immediately adjacent to an existing wastewater pump station that ECUA owns. Uh, near 5080 uh, Mobile Highway. It's where the um, creek crosses the road there at Mobile Highway going over to uh, Bayou Marcus. Uh, our existing wastewater pump station needs some serious upgrades. We've got uh, serious floodplain issues in the area as well. So we're proposing to purchase property that's immediately adjacent to this. It's a, it appears to be a residential size, uh, residential uh, constructed home. It may or may not be also used uh, commercially um, as well. And we're proposing that it would be uh, less expensive for the scope of improvement we need to do at that station. If we had the additional property, then it would be to stay within the very limiting um, right away or easement area that we already have and have to deal with floodplain issues and, and, and other such. So uh, it's our recommendation that we uh, proceed with the purchase of this property so we can uh, upgrade uh, the Charbar lift station. I see no speakers on this, so thank you, Mr. Woody. Item G uh, I is adoption of general resolution number GR 22-55, general resolution authorizing the executive director to issue a purchase order to Ferguson Water Works for check valves for the wastewater collection system and provide an effective date. Ferguson Water Works uh, was the um, low bidder for replacement of check valves. We purchase those on a regular basis. This uh, particular order ranges from a size 4 inch to 12 inch, and uh, it's our recommendation that we proceed with this purchase. And seeing no speakers, we'll move to item J. Adoption of General Resolution Number GR 22-56, a general resolution authorizing the acceptance and awarding of bid and authorizing the executive director to execute a purchase order with Davison Fuels and Oil, LLC, for 15W40 motor oil and AW68 hydraulic oil and providing an effective date. Uh, this is a very routine purchase. We did receive three bids in the the most responsive bidder was Davison Fuels and Oils, whom we've done business with before. That's our recommend. This is for um, um, our mechanics division uh, to service our ECUA fleet. And I see no speakers. Item K, adoption of general resolution number GR 2257, general resolution notifying the board of an emergency purchase order issued to Gulf Coast Industrial to perform emergency <coughs> coating replacement. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, of our four granular activative carbon vessels at the Humphreys well site. Um, it's of utmost importance that we have uh, all the well resources uh, available going into the prime portion of the year, which is certainly coming up with uh, as, the, as the weather heats up. So we've had some problems at the Humphreys well site, and we want to resolve those on an expeditious um, uh, basis. Uh, we were losing some of our um, of our uh, filtering media uh, at that site, so we had an evaluated uh, portion of the problem. It had to do with some work that was done by a previous contractor. Uh, we resolved that issue through negotiations and um, came up with an agreement where uh, we were going to make some uh, improvements to the site but our contractor was also going to pay for some of those at uh, their expense. So it's our recommendation that we proceed with uh, Gulf Coast uh, Industrial to make uh, not only repairs, but also upgrades to the uh, GA system, GAC system at that site for $119,800. Ms. Campbell? Uh, so 
there was a premature failure of the pipe, or did we, uh, for, of the coatings that were on the pipe, did, <coughs> they, did they use a different coating? Are they going to use a different? The um, there's uh, four uh, GAC cells at that location, and um, the failure was around the valves at the bottom of the of the structure. Uh, so we've had some rusting problems as well. Um, we have had them uh, uh, two at a time, completely uh, empty and resandblast the inside, fill any, do pit welding to fill any uh, divots, and then completely recoat the inside. Uh, they're doing uh, the uh, repair work to uh, the valves at the bottom themselves. Uh, we are paying for the differential cost to have a full sandblast rather than just a spot sandblast that was done previously. So that's an enhancement we feel should be our expense. Uh, but because we had some premature failure, uh, they're going to uh, bear at their expense um, redoing the valve work at the bottom. So are we using a different coating this time? Um, it wasn't a coating uh, problem so much, I think, as a surface preparation problem. Okay. Yeah, we've, we've had good luck with the coatings in the past. All right. So that's Thank not you. That's my only question. Thank you. Uh, the next item is item... L, adoption of general resolution number GR2258, a general resolution authorizing the executive director to enter into a cooperative purchase agreement with InfoSend Inc. for the outsourcing sourcing of utility billing and delinquent notice printing services. Mr. Woody. Uh, you'll remember that for many years we had contracted services with uh, Pinnacle Data Systems. We would send them a uh, download of our billing. They would print our bills and then uh, mail them. Uh, they had some significant struggles last year. Uh, they relocated one of their plants and uh, fairly abruptly started providing really poor service and uh, our customers were receiving bills late. Uh, in the transition, we, under an emergency basis, uh, transferred uh, the service over to InfoSend under a negotiated agreement. Uh, they performed stellar. Uh, we're re really pleased with their services. However, uh, we did go through, now that we've got that uh, issue worked out, and did a formal uh, bid process. Uh, InfoSend uh, was our low bidder, and we now have a lower right, rate that we're recommending through this agreement than that we did, than the one we had negotiated on an emergency basis. Uh, what is the length of this contract? Uh, I can't remember, is this, yeah, it's a series of one, do you, go ahead. Yeah, two M or three M, I don't remember. Three, okay. Uh, so, yeah. If, if you didn't hear what Justin said, this is a one-year renewal yeah. with three one-year, so you know, one-year contract with three-year, one-year renewals. So, what we would hope is each year the volume would go down so that our price would be lower as we convert more and more people to electronic billing. Yeah, that would be ideal. Uh, I see no other speakers. Uh, the next item, thank you, Mr. Woody and uh, Mr. Smith. Item M is adoption of general resolution number GR22-59, general resolution in support of the executive director amending salaries of certain positions whose primary duties require a commercial driver's license, using salary savings from position vacancies to fund these additional expenses for the remainder of fiscal year 2022 and to recognize that the fiscal year 2023 budget will require a separate 1% rate increase in wa water wastewater fees and a 3% increase in sanitation fees absent any reduction of other expenditures. Mr. Woody. My first point of clarification is to understand that uh, your vote of approval does not uh, make a statement that you're going to increase water wastewater rates or sanitation rates by the proposed amounts. It's just uh, an informational <clears throat> to make you aware that uh, the potential impact for next year uh, could be that much just based on this decision alone. We have sufficient, uh, let me back up. Um, as you know, we made some adjustments uh, in last year's budget to continue to chase the uh, upward rising trend of uh, hourly wages for uh, positions that require a commercial driver's license or CDL. Um, in our organization, that's primarily our sanitation drivers and folks over in uh, regions and lift stations who drive very uh, large vehicles. Uh, we have scattered positions throughout the organization uh, 
uh, who occasionally will drive those vehicles uh, on an occasional basis, but this is primarily um, to address those who do it on a regular basis as a part of their regular duties and drive on a regular basis. So we have raised rates uh, previously last year. However, uh, we continue to um, chase that salary, um, which continues to rise amongst our various competitors, uh, some of which are even offering sign-on bonuses on, on top of that. Uh, what we're proposing is an additional $2 an hour increase uh, across the board for those positions that require a CDL. Uh, last time we did that, we, we um, increased the starting wage by uh, about that amount and then had a decreasing amount of increase for other folks based on longevity in order to try to limit the amount of compression that creates inside our pay scale. Uh, this time, we realize that we're having problems all up and down the scale and uh, we're as concerned about our existing employees not leading to other offers as we are the ability to uh, hire uh, for our entry-level positions. So as proposed, this would uh, add additional $2 for all those positions, not only in sanitation where we're probably feeling at the worst, but uh, to address uh, internal equity concerns, we're doing it across the organization. The, um, because we've had a number of vacancies in these positions over the course of the year, there is sufficient uh, funds in existing uh, FY22 year to complete this year if this is approved by the board without having to ask for additional appropriations to finish the year. However, the overall implications for FY23 uh, is about a million and a half dollars across both enterprises. Uh, to give you a feel for what the financial impact of uh, that is, if uh, those positions in water wastewater, which is a much larger enterprise, uh, would take about a 1% increase in, in rates to generate that equivalent amount of revenue. Uh, on the sanitation side, which is a smaller enterprise and has a larger um, uh, group of CDL drivers, the impact would be about 3%. Now, next year's budget is an entirely different discussion, uh, but this resolution is just uh, requesting your um, approval and endorsement for um, for me to go ahead and use existing funds we have in this fiscal year to enact a $2 an hour increase. Thank you, Mr. Woody. Um, Mr. Williams. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the question I would pose is, do you feel as though this increase will solve the problem? That was a big question, Mr. Woody. You want to? <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, let me answer that in two parts. Number one, uh, we are currently conducting a compensation study for the whole organization. Um, this is the time that it would have normally come up anyway, independent of all these other uh, of all these other issues. It's important that we um, periodically um, solicit information from our peers in the region to make sure that our pay scales are competitive and fair. Uh, to our individuals. So that happens to be going on at the same time. I would actually be surprised if, if the results of that comp study don't recommend even further adjustments. Perhaps it might be adjustments to the um, top and, and, and bottom of the brackets, uh, or it might be uh, other adjustments in other locations. I think we're still chasing that number, and I think it's still on the move. Uh, so in, in a single word, no, I don't think it'll, it's the final resolution. I think that's <laughs> Yeah, and I guess if I, was, if I was not asking that big question, the, the, the more direct question would be, are our lack of CDL drivers because of the wages? Uh, it's not always exclusively that, but I, that is far and away the, the major problem, yes. Okay. We, we, we do exit interviews uh, when folks leave us. And that's usually at the top of the list is wages. Uh, we do um, solicit any and all feedback we get to make sure that we're being a good employer, that benefits are correct, and, and those sorts of things. And we, get, do, we do get snippets of other feedback as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Mr. Stevens. Yeah, and I would just like to echo what, what Director Woody just said. Um, 
Mr. Williams is, I think that's a massive factor is the pay. So, you know, I always kind of leverage some of my private sector work and, and I've got hundreds of CDL drivers with, crossing various uh, companies, class A licenses and so forth. And I can tell you definitively that is a major factor. It's a factor that this board and ECUA are dealing with now and the, the major storm is coming in, in the next year or so. I mean, our deficit with CDL drivers now is not good. And I, I, mm. I, I spoke about this last year and we voted for a rate increase mm. targeted more towards the CDL drivers and, and other ones. Um, you know, our ma major competitor is the private sector. I know because I try to discourage folks from interviewing public utilities <laughs> employees. But uh, I can tell you definitively, you know, they're out there looking. They're looking daily. Um, our folks are getting headhunted. Our drivers are getting headhunted. Probably from the from the. Uh, thankfully, we fill up some of our own gas stations. But um, but I, I've, I've I've got I get my guys headhunted um, constantly. Um, you know, before you know we were at the top of the scale when it came to benefits package. So everybody would talk about ECUA and having great magnificent benefits, and we do. We have we're blessed. We have some good benefits, retirement packages, and so the private sector was lagging behind um, that. Well, now the private sector, due to the labor shortage, is catching up, and they're catching up with a lightning quickness with health insurance, retirement programs, and so forth. So when you're waving that carrot out there with a little bit lower pay, but better benefits, um, and you start to lose um, the sparkle, the sheen of those better benefits, it becomes, it becomes, even, it becomes even more competitive. And then uh, they're, they're not, um, I know PJC, uh, PJC, that's shows my yes. age, but Pensacola State College, um, I know has, has got some programs uh, that, that they've instituted to train new people, but the other problem is, Folks are not getting into the CDL um, business. I mean, I've got companies right now running ads, and um, I'm not going to disclose that currently on what we're offering. But um, uh, but anyway, uh, and I think, Mr. Woody, the city, for example, I know at one point they were paying more than we were paying for a comparable job. So have we done a comparison between what ECUA pays and what the city of Pensacola pays? And is it still where they're paying a smidge more than we are? Uh, I believe we bought ourselves up to match them. Um, I think the only difference is I th think they may still have a sign-on bonus, minor, minor one. Right, and, and that's what I'm saying. So, so, so to your response to, to, to Mr. Williams, and, and I appreciate your, 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 your honesty is, you know, this is not going to be the last discussion we're going to have about pay increases um, with our folks. Um, with, with, with I think it's 65 um, open positions. Um, I, I anticipate that number to grow. Um, and I anticipate it to get even more competitive um, in, in, in the months to come. But uh, anyway, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Ms. Campbell. I think this was a, all started during COVID and everybody started ordering everything, staying at home, ordering everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're still doing it, you know, I mean, just hurting businesses too. Um, but all societal issues like this, they, they sometimes tend to correct and then sometimes they even overcorrect. So let's just pray that this one does. Um, I, I know we're going to continue to seek employee by um, working with the schools and colleges. Mm -hmm. And every day I just keep thinking I'm going to turn on that television and see a really cool commercial of a cool guy in a garbage truck and us asking them to come and work at ECUA, how great our benefits are. I, I saw one the other day for the sheriff's office and it was cool. I mean, they, they made it look like a cool place to work. So I think we need to do the same thing, get on television and say, you know, come drive this back daddy truck <laughs> and play, pay good benefits. So I watch those commercials. I hope to see one pretty soon. I, I think this will correct itself, but it may take three or four years to do. Um, and, and we're not the only, we're not the only job that's offering incentive payments right now. Well, mm -hmm. the truth I, is we're with the movement of self-driving vehicles, mm -hmm. We're going to create all of this expertise with CDL drivers, and there's going to be a time in not too distant future where a lot of that demand is going to evaporate very suddenly. I think for sanitation workers, it's going to be harder for automated trucks to fill that, but there are going to be long-haul drivers who suddenly yeah. will find this. So, you know, it's that is an area that is very much in flux, but right now, we need to make sure that we're doing what it does to meet the needs of our customers, and, and we're having trouble doing it without this kind of flexibility. So thank you for bringing this to us, Mr. Woody. Uh, Ms. Campbell, 
Can you bring your mic a little bit closer? I'm sorry. It's not picking up your voice for some reason. Okay. Got better? I keep pushing it away because I can't get it to go off. Yes, Jim said it's better. I don't want a heavy breathe on every. Okay, does that get it to go off? That concludes the um, consent agenda. Uh, we have had nothing pulled from it, so is there a motion to adopt the items on the consent agenda? That's not it. Okay, Mr. Stevens has moved the consent agenda. Did you second it, Ms. Campbell? Um, are you with us, Amanda? I think we're ready for a vote. One second. Sure. Okay, please vote. And it passes 5-0. Uh, if you will correct it in the minutes, please, that that was moved by Mr. Stevens and seconded by Ms. Campbell when we, when we amend the minutes. Okay, the, the, we come now to the budget report, Mr. Smith. Good afternoon. I've um, got attached here the uh, year-to-date budget report for March 31st, which represents 50% of the fiscal year uh, 22 that we're currently in. There's really not a whole lot to report here. Um, as you can see, most all the, the divisions are, you know, at or below very near 50% uh, on their expenditures for the years. There's a couple that are that are over, but just like in the last few months, that's mainly related to those encumbrances for the uh, purchase orders that we do at the beginning of the year to cover materials and supplies for the whole year. No red flags. No. Oh, I see no speakers. Does anyone have any questions of Mr. Smith? Um, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. The next item is the executive director's report. Mr. Woody, you are recognized. I just have two items. Um, you'll find on page 222 under 11A, a memorandum of uh, notice of an emergency purchase. When we make a purchase above $60,000 for uh, materials, it usually goes through a, a bid process unless it's deemed an emergency. In this particular case, uh, we did have an emergency that we felt needed to be addressed. Um, the lead time on recovering materials now is such a challenge uh, that when we had one of our emergency uh, backup generators out at the Pensacola Beach uh, plant uh, go down, we were with hurricane season coming up, we were anxious about the length of time it would uh, take to get that back up. Now, the plant actually consists of two separate plants of two separate uh, generators, but uh, going into the active season, uh, we didn't want to wait for an uh, extensive length of time, 12, 16 weeks, something for um, for the work, for the materials that we needed to uh, repair this generator. So uh, we were able to receive, uh, after much solicitation, a, uh, a bid from Gulf Coast Electric Motor Service for $60,600 for the uh, generator end of the electric generator end of the uh, uh, generator. So they were able to commit to a timeline of only six to eight weeks uh, that has already been ordered some time back. I don't have a date that that's going to be complete. You might, Jerry. Okay, so we're down to four or five weeks or something or less before that should be done. Uh, second item, I just I want to remind 
uh, the board that we have on a, an annual basis a um, series of recognitions we do for our uh, employees, uh, employee recognitions, and uh, this year we'll be doing that uh, again, uh, a series of individual meeting uh, locations. Uh, first one is the 28th of, uh, of April, and there are several others I uh, emailed you separately in the board report. Uh, but the first one of those uh, comes up on the 28th. It's a nice opportunity for us to recognize our employees and their years of services. We also announced Employee of the Year and Supervisor of the Year uh, at, that look, uh, at that time. Uh, we have one employee who's reaching a 40-year milestone uh, this year. So uh, we are an um, employer of, of preference. We do provide uh, good, uh, good benefits and, and good pay. And, and uh, as recognized by the length of time that we have many employees stay with us. So if you have an opportunity to come by and, and see us and, and join us for lunch. Thank you, Mr. Woody. Uh, we come now to the attorney's report. Mr. Beasley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no report this evening. Has questions for Mr. Beasley? Okay. Uh, unfinished business. Um, Mr. Perkins, you asked us to discuss the water testing around the Bruce Beach area. Yeah, I, I uh, read the article in the paper today, and I would just like for us to gather all the information we can, all the reports, data, everything, look at it very carefully and see if there's anything whatsoever we can do to be helpful in the situation. Like Mr. Woody was trying to say, it's a complex situation. There are a lot of different sources, but if any of the sources are ours and we have leaky pipes, I want us to fix them. You know, uh, we may have already tested or lined. I know we've spent millions and millions of dollars in the downtown area doing sewer <coughs> repair, and some, some districts might be resentful and say, oh, we need to spend some of that money in, in my district. I'm not like that. I think that beach has the potential to really be vibrant for this community. It's going to be something that all districts use, so I'm... If there are issues that we have, I'm willing to spend the money down there to, to address them, you know, and, and, and to help find other issues if there are other issues. I mean, Mr. Woody was telling me that, you know, the downtown library was hooked up directly to the sewer, you know, not, not the ECUA sewer, the stormwater sewer, you know, and there, I'm sure there may be houses and businesses that were developed way before, you know, inspections were, were, um, were real. You know, I grew up in the 70s, and they used to dump raw sewage and chemicals into the river by my house. You couldn't swim in it. You couldn't fish in it. I mean, it was, di it was disgusting. So a lot of that stuff happened. That whole area was developed pre-70s, you know, so who knows what's down there. But anything we can do to help, I don't know if they can smoke test the stormwater system and see if it comes out of different buildings and stuff. I know, I know we can smoke test our system. It may be that there's private laterals. You know, she was saying that they were in the yards, that the bacteria was in the yards. Well, if it's in the yards, not the main, I mean, and we can do a smoke test to show where those breaks are in the yards, I'd be willing to, to help with that. I mean, you know, I'm willing to cooperate and do whatever we can, and I think the board is. We've always been real, real um, con conscientious and, and, you know, trying to help, particularly in matters of public health and safety. So I'd just like to... You know, after, especially after hearing, you know, what Mr. Woody has to say on it, because I don't know everything that's been done down there, but I, I would like to see us um, coordinate with the city and any other entity and see if there's anything that uh, we may be responsible for or may be helpful with, if there is some things that we're responsible for to address them, if there's some areas we can be helpful with and help find solutions, you know, that other entities may, may have some responsibility for, you know, we should help with that. But I... I think that, uh, you know, that's just the way we operate, and I'm sure the staff will do that. I just wanted to bring it up and make sure that we're, you know, that we're addressing it, that we're on it, and that we're not just sitting by and, and not addressing it. Mr. Woody. Yeah, to complete the comments that uh, we began at the, earlier of the, uh, the evening, as, as you'll remember in our annual budget, we commit uh, $9 million a year alone in just... Uh, cast in place pipe improvements both to the main lines and to uh, individual service lines across our entire organization of, of that the largest subset is in this very watershed we've spent five million dollars a year the last three years alone doing that type of work uh, in that watershed just last year we spent over a million dollars improving or replacing 
the uh, pumps at the Government Street um, uh, pump station. Uh, and to bring it in at only a million dollars, <laughs> it would have been much more, but we were able to do it at that price because our staff did it as an in-house project. So uh, we are committed to do that. Our laboratory and pretreatment uh, staff um, uh, regularly, if we, when we uh, either uh, hear about illicit connections or the suspicion of illicit connections, uh, such as the example given by uh, Board Member Perkins just a, a moment ago, uh, where the library was connected to a storm sewer. Uh, th these are issues that go back decades and decades, and they're, they're hard to find. Uh, but when they come about, we address them, we correct them. Um, and the watershed is so large, we do need to keep in mind that, that there are septic tanks that have issues in the same watershed. So um, they won't, these corrections won't happen overnight and to nobody's satisfaction, they, they take more time than anybody would like, like to see. It would be nice if we could Madam Chairman, may I make nice our fingers and be done. You know, and there was one thing in the report that, that caught my attention and that's why I'd like for us to get any of these reports have been done and look at them very carefully. But there was reportedly an area and it was, I think it was along Roof Street in a couple of locations which, which may signify that there's a problem along that line where even in dry times, there was high reading. So they may not be stormwater induced. And so it may be that there's broken mains and yards or even if we have a crack pipe or something, I would like us to get that report and look specifically in those areas to make sure that we're not contributing to it. And if we are, that we address it. Perkins, um, Ms. Campbell. I think back to the number one project that the experts wanted us to spend BP money on, and it was daylighting Washerman's Creek. And Washerman's Creek runs all the way down uh, Spring Street, the reason they call it Spring Street, uh, Roos Street. I even did free title work back when they were doing this years, many, many years ago to find out who owned some of those properties uh, and what properties would be affected. And it would have cost back then $8 million. And what a difference it would have made in that entire area. But you know, now it probably cost $50 million. So you know, hindsight's 2020, but it didn't even make our, our final list. Not, not ECUA, but the, the people that were dealing with the BP money. So, in hindsight, I think um, there's a lot of things that a lot of us would have done differently with BP monies if we had the chance. I've been working, and I was going to tell Ms. Horning, uh, you might want to reach out to um, Senator Broxson because he's uh, working with a group of people that are trying to get some of those BP federal funds, not the stuff that's going through DEP, but some of those federal funds. It's really hard to get at, but he really wants to do it. He's got a waterborne issue of his own right now, and he's finding out how difficult it is to get to that money. And what's going to happen with that money is it's eventually going to get swept back into the government. Um, you know, we protected our, our monies in Florida, but the federal monies were not so much protected. And with all these meetings that we're having, we've only had one federal liaison show up, and that was not the federal liaison from Florida. It was the one from Alabama. Chris, can't remember Chris's name, but fantastic guy and really working with this group of people. Bruce went to uh, one of the meetings. It's a good meeting. I don't think that we're going to see anything happen overnight with it, but Ms. Horning might want to contact him. She has a story to tell. He's wanting to tell stories to these people. It might be a good story to tell. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Just a couple questions. So we've been working on it for over seven years. Can we speak to the progress we've made? Can we speak to the progress we've made? Um, my, my main response there would be the money that we've invested in relining existing sewers. Uh, we install a cast-in-place uh, pipe product 
in our mainline sewers uh, to help protect from exfiltration of of uh, sewage from a line that may be in, in poor condition. Uh, we've, in the last three years alone, we've spent $15 million doing that work in this watershed alone, uh, as well as uh, watersheds and throughout the rest of the, the district as well. In certain locations where we know that a contributing factor is the private house lateral between the house and our connection, we've even made some improvements in line portions of the lateral between our connection in the property line. We can't go outside the right of way lines if we're back on private property, but sometimes that is a, a source of problems. Um, the health department is one that, that, that manages and, and inspects uh, septic tanks, but uh, we have worked on projects to um, do septic sewer conversion in some locations where there's um, receptive uh, neighborhoods that would like to uh, actually make an investment to make a, a permanent connection to a sewer rather than continue on septic tanks as well. Testing, have, do we do any testing? Um, as part of our routine work, we do smoke testing, uh, and then we also do uh, dye testing. The purpose of smoke testing is to find uh, breaks in um, not only our lines or manholes uh, where water can get in, uh, but also in the private service line. Say somebody has a clean out in a yard that's broken off, been mowed over, or something broken for some reason. Um, because uh, if we have places where uh, inf direct inflow through openings or infiltration through groundwater seeping into the system can overload a system when it rains and therefore cause uh, overflows downstream. So we want to make that system as watertight uh, as we possibly can. So the only thing going into it and being conveyed by it is sanitary sewage and not groundwater or, or stormwater. So that's a, a regular program that we do. Um, and when we get reports of illicit connections or our crews that are working out in the area see uh, something in, or, or say if the city of Pensacola uh, tells us, hey, it hasn't rained in five days, that we're getting flow in this particular location, you know, then we'll do some smoke testing or dye testing to see if there's an illicit connection someplace. But no, no bio test to determine if the, like that watershed you're talking about, mm -hmm. if we've improved the uh, biohazards in the area over the course of time. I mean, it's obviously still a problem, but is a problem any less now than it was seven years ago? The biohazard. Uh, I, 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 I can't personally speak. So uh, we don't do that. Test we, we, that. We don't have way. a program where we're regularly sampling uh, in some of the locations that have recently been sampled that, that uh, Ms. Horning just addressed. We, we don't have a program where we're regularly sampling, like in locations where Ms. Horning j just suggested. We, we do in response to if we have a, uh, a CSO or, or, excuse me, an SSO problem, but uh, not, during, uh, not during dry weather. Who's, is that someone else's responsibility? Uh, generally, the health department, FDEP, uh, Florida, um, Water and waste. There's a number of organizations that do some of those as well. Yes. And and lastly, the library on Spring Street was connected to stormwater? Yes. The library? <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I understand you said yes, but I don't understand how that could be and if that's true, it is true, obviously it is true, who's, that's, that's a big issue. No. I, I, I don't know, I, I think I recall maybe when that library was built, but I always thought it was a relatively new building and there should have, that shouldn't be the case. So are, are you telling me that perhaps there are other buildings that are, you that are incorrectly connected to the output system 
where it should be to septic and our sewer and it may be the stormwater in that area? Not ones that we are aware of, but when we find out about them, we go about investigating and have them disconnected and connected appropriately. So you know, decades and decades ago, before there was wastewater treatment, uh, you've, you've heard the saying, the solution to pollution is dilution. It was common in the oldest parts of the community for the sanitary sewer system and the storm sewer system to be interconnected so that the storm water would flush that out, uh, out, to, out to the ocean. I'm Maybe just one more question, Richard. Sure. I'm dead. Fortunately, that uh, has, hasn't been the case for decades, but there, every once in a while we'll find a connection that's that's been made inappropriately. So obviously it's, it's not wholeheartedly ECUA's issue, but is there any any way that um, would that being true about the library connected? Is there who would be the powers that be to say help? the residents solve this problem? I mean, for that watershed, the big watershed, and, and perhaps the stormwater system uh, being utilized uh, incorrectly for sewer, uh, who could help in addition to uh, ECUA being properly connected and reconnecting when we find out we're not connected correctly? Um, help residents solve that problem that's that seems to, that seems to me to be uh, grossly uh, I don't want to say negligent but grossly done wrong and 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 they're rightfully so complaining if that's an example of how wrong it's been done and so who in government uh, whether it's federal, whether it's state, uh, whether it's local, should be able to help figure out what else may be incorrectly connected that's causing this problem now. Because, uh, everybody wants solutions to problems. And if, and if we could just know where to go as citizens to put the right questions to uh, our leaders, then we can expect answers to those problems. So I know this may not be us directly, but I'm asking if you could add some uh, clarity to the concerns that have been addressed this evening. Mr. Woody. Yeah. Uh, of the four primary sources, there's public sewer system of which ECUA has been in, has inherited and, and been, in, been in charge of since 1981. Uh, there's a private portion of the system that's going to be the laterals that connect individual properties to the public system, so that's the second component. Uh, third are septic tanks, um, which are managed by the health department. Um, and then, and then lastly, the storm sewer system that's generally overseen and owned and operated by either the county or the city, depending on the jurisdiction. So the, the, the public, a, 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 a public entities um, um, have some responsibilities for the storm sewer system, overseeing the, the regulation of the septic tank system, and then the public portions that Eastway uh, has for the public and uh, for the conveyance system. Um, the rest of that's uh, private. So uh, we The rest are, of it is what? Excuse me? The rest of, that, rest of that is private. Okay. Unless there's a, uh, a problem. A, um, and we're investing $15, $18 million a year uh, on that, on our system to make it more watertight and then help uh, improve it. And we try to be as responsive as we can when, we, when either our crews find illicit connections or illicit connections are reported to us. Um, I think I've been consistent this, about. I don't just. I do care about the money, but when you when you put the money out there like that, I need to know how the money is solving the uh, issues. How the money over eight over years, eighteen million dollars over years, is making our system uh, intake watertight 
improving our water tight integrity versus we're still just putting money uh, over the several years and can't speak to results. So I get we're investing money, but I'm also wanting to hear you tell me that has improved the water tight integrity of our wastewater system or something to that effect. Yeah, the, the, the $15 million alone in, in cast in place pipe investment, uh, we, we have sewers are 70 to 100 years uh, of age, made out of tile with joints every three feet. The, and the, and the, the joints at every three feet are very poorly constructed. So, uh, those are locations for water to get in and out of the system. Uh, we uh, install a cast in place pipe on the inside of that pipe system. Uh, in fact, we discussed it at my office here the other yes, day. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and provides a continuous liner along that entire pipe from one manhole to the other, eliminating those joints every three feet, increasing the structural integrity of the pipe, and closing all of the jo those joints that might exist. Um, every three feet, plus any cracks that might exist in the, in the pipe as well. Okay. That dramatically increases the integrity of that pipe to keep water from getting, storm water from getting into the Money system. well spent. Money well spent. Thank you. But there are miles and miles and miles and miles of pipe. In that area yet to go? In that area, let alone the entire, yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Woody, I know it's a health department function, do we, but do we have a map of the uh, existing septic tanks that are in that watershed that you could provide for us? Um, we do. And, and the second thing is, at my experience is these are kind of hit or miss. They're never part of an ongoing uh, sewer expansion program, at least in that immediate downtown area. Each, each one is sort of an individual case. Is there any way for us to map out a program where we can help some of these individual property owners who have septic tanks identify the nearest place where they could connect and then access some CRA money or other money to help them connect to our system. Is that a program that we can develop in-house with our engineering staff? Um, one point of clarification, it's not that so much that we have maps of where septic tanks are, uh, but by default, right. we, we know where our sewer system exists and by default where septic tanks much, must exist uh, otherwise. Um, yes, we can identify little islands of area that are not served by sewer and which could be served through an extension. Um, as we discussed before, depending on how we do the extensions, right. et cetera, it, it costs about fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars a connection, a uh, little little bit less perhaps in the more dense areas it's of downtown. It's pretty dense, yeah. If we can develop that kind of an overview and look at how we can attack that in that area, the second thing is I know we've done smoke testing to determine where there are leaky laterals. Um, how far are we in that watershed with information? And has that gone to the individual homeowners um, to affect repairs? Uh, when we conduct smoke testing and we find a problem, they are given a notification and a, uh, that tells them that it was found, uh, an op a phone number where they can contact us and let us uh, talk with them and get more detail. They're given a specified time to correct the defect. Uh, if they don't correct uh, the defect, uh, then we actually increase their bill by an additional uh, $50, $50? $50? What's the dollar amount? I think it's $50. Yeah. Uh, so there's a financial incentive to correct something that could possibly be fixed by as little as a $2.50 screw-in uh, cap on their clean-out. Uh, certainly it could be something much more expensive that might require a, a, a plumber to spend some money to replace a portion of their leak. And we've talked about how a lot of times an, an immediate fix <clears throat> is not the $2, but it's something that's True. very unaffordable for so most cool. families and certainly in an economically depressed area. Do we follow up and reach out to them and say, here's what is needed and here's how we can help? Because we've talked about 
you know, finding a way to help them get the funding for that. Do Are we proactive in counseling these people? Uh, yes, we are. There are several ways by which folks can receive assistance. Um, some of those are through either the county or city, depending on which jurisdiction they right. live in. Uh, the Community Development Block Grant Program uh, has funding assistance where they can pay actually 100% of said improvement if uh, they're in a low to moderate census tract and they meet income qualifications. Uh, the CRA has similar programs and funding available as well. Uh, we also have programs where uh, kind of as a last resort where we can actually help uh, finance some repairs. It does come at, a, at an interest rate. We encourage them to go to the private market for obtaining right. that type of funding rather than us, but that's available right. as well. And, and what is our success rate in, in getting these repairs done after we've identified them? 50%, 75%, 2%? Um, yeah, if, if, if you would uh, let me grab numbers as wide as that, because I can quote you an exact number. I say it's, it's fairly good, 75% or higher than that. Okay. Stacy's giving me the thumbs okay. up, but it's even higher okay. than that. So we, and that's that's good news. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to follow up with that other percentage and see how we can make that happen. Finally, and, I, and Mr. Perkins and Mr. Stevens want to speak too. Uh, will you walk through our protocols after an SSO event, what we do, mm -hmm. short term, and then what do we do as follow up longer term? Um, or, and, and add to that, what we do when we get a report of fecal material in, in an area, what are our specific protocols? Okay. They, they vary a little bit depending on the scope right. of improvement. So uh, the more typical might, one might be to say if we have a, a grease choke and we have an individual isolated location where a manhole backs up in the street <coughs> because uh, accumulation of grease has, has blocked the main and we've had a, a, a sewer then surcharges and comes out of manhole. Um, we uh, file reports on each one of those to the FDEP. Uh, we immediately respond to first vacuum out and clean out the, the surcharge to be sure that we're not backing folks up uh, that are upstream of that location. Uh, we clear uh, the, the blockage, um, retrieve uh, as much and material that was spilled as is pr practical and we report on what we think was spilled versus what we were able to retrieve versus not retrieved. And then we treat the area with uh, uh, bactericide. Uh, that's on the simple uh, low side. The other extreme are such events as uh, the hurricanes or the 2014 flood. You know, uh, if it's uh, an event that is really affecting the entire community, then it's really hard to tell uh, where the, the original source of the problem is. It's uh, stormwater throughout the system. Even uh, when the street floods and our manholes are, are underwater too, then it's hard to keep water out of the, uh, out of the system. Uh, likewise, we're still reporting to the FDEP where we think we had spills. Uh, in those extreme events, of course, it can't be quantified, but we identify all the, all the locations we can and um, report on where we were successfully keeping up with the volume of flow that was coming to stations versus where we were not. Um, we've made some investments in the past several years for um, holding tanks to uh, help increase our ability to address that. At the same time, we're also investing in things like cast-in-place pipe to uh, reduce the ability for water to get into the system in the first place. Uh, and finally, how do we find out about the library? Uh, How do you that was several years ago. That was told yeah. to me, so I don't know. I don't have first-hand knowledge of that story. So, okay. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Perkins. Thank you, Mr. Woody, for your answers. Oh, Mr. Perkins, Mr. Woody. Sorry, has Mr. Stevens spoken yet? I'm not spoken. Sure if go ahead. Go ahead. I'll yield because he's standing. Now he's gonna mess up my system. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Perkins, <laughs> and, uh, and I'll, I'll I'll be brief. I am. Um, and you already addressed, Mr. Woody, uh, some of my some of my uh, questions about uh, as that, that uh, Chairwoman Miss um, Benson um, had addressed on how do some of the folks at some of the lower income brackets are they able to fix that? Because some of the smoke tests that you and um, um, Mr. Perkins alluded to to find that there may be some issues or some breaks on the private property owners 
Um, and then you say, if we find it, we put them on notice and then add $50 uh, to their bill, which I'm assuming that's some sort of incentive to get them to, re to, to repair the, um, the, the, the break. But do we have the ability as part of our program, if it's something smaller, to like notify them, like, look, we're going to give you 10 days to fix this. If not, we're going to fix it for you. Um, and then add that to their bill because because, because my, my, my concern is the $50 fine is all well and good, but if you've got issues where there's active sewage being dispersed <coughs> and bubbling up in the ground, and then of course when it rains, it gets out in the street, and it's all well and good, we're fining that person $50 a month, but the, the problem's still not being fixed and they're still discharging sewage. So I'm just I'm wondering if there's a alternate to that. Is uh, You described actually two different... Madam Chair, sure. uh, two different scenarios. If uh, if water if uh, sewage is surfacing, um, then if it isn't immediately dealt with and abated, we'll turn water off to the to the, to the property. Okay. Um, if, however, we find that um, smoke is emanating from a, a break in their line that isn't causing a public health problem in terms of it getting out in um, uh, at the local surface there but it provides a potential for groundwater to get in. Uh, then our challenge is that uh, it's on private property. Um, enforcement of the private side line is really a uh, code enforcement, plumbing code type of issue with the city or county depending on, on the jurisdiction. So uh, likewise, getting on private property and making a re repair uh, on that private property without the permission of the property owner is a legal challenge as well. Sure, and, and then and then a follow up. Uh, same thing on the septic tanks. I mean, we've got there's septic tanks in areas there that were originally put in because there was not access to sewer. Sure. Fast forward um, where we are today in 2022, there are still areas where they don't have access to sewer. So we have issues where we've got individuals who, for whatever reason, and again, I've got 40 some odd acres and I'm on septic and have no desire to be on sewer, <laughs> or where I am. But uh, but. Um, it's not offered, so it's not, it's not an option for me. But uh, but there are situations where they are on septic and um, and, and they're not offered. Um, but but I, I, I do believe you had alluded to the fact we have a finance program for those individuals who do have access to sewer now that for whatever reason have, well, I'm, I'm sure it's a financial reason. I mean, I, I would think that's the only logical reason right now is, is that you've, you've got sewer availability You've got an old septic tank. You're on a fixed income, retirement, Social Security. You're not able to spend the uh, $2,800 or whatever it is. But we offer that finance program to as well. And is it something that we kind of send out to them, maybe on an annual basis, just just as a remembrance? I know you, you get it one time, but are we are we constantly? You know, squeaky wheel gets the grease. Are we constantly sending this out to these homeowners? And FYI, just we got sewer still there right across the street. But, you know, here's some, some payment options. I, I, can't, I can't honestly say that we that we do that on a regular basis, that we send out a reminder notification of the availability of sewer. Uh, when sewers were installed, they're provided all the information. And, of course, we have the encouragement, uh, financial encouragement that the board has provided by waiving the uh, connection cost, a little over $1,600 that they connect within that first year, which is a fee that, that comes back to bear on them if they wait more than uh, a year. So that, that's our initial encouragement. Uh, once that year goes, goes by, um, uh, no, I can't say that we have a reminder uh, mailer. Reminder is when your sewer fails. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Mr. Perkins. Thank you. You know, I want to help on this problem and we'll do all I can. It, uh, it gets frustrating because we have a a very limited limited area of authority and responsibility. We oversee the sanitary sewer system, the sewage. That's all we have authority over. We can't regulate marinas. We have no say on stormwater, what happens with stormwater. You know, marinas are DEP. Stormwater is the county or the, or the city, depending on where it's located. Septic tanks, the health department. You know, private enforcement would probably be both DEP and local governments. And, and so... No matter how hard we try, ECUA is not going to be able to fix this on our own. Now, I think it's imperative that, you know, we work with the people on this report and with the other people involved and, and find if there's anywhere where we have responsibility that we take care of it, that we accept responsibility and we address it. And don't be afraid or embarrassed by that or anything. Just 
diligently looked at it. Quite frankly, the report looks pretty fair to me. I mean, I haven't seen a report, but just what I read about it in the paper, you know, I mean, it's not, you know, pointing fingers saying this person's responsible, that person's responsible, that person's responsible. I say there's a lot of problems, you know. And I know, you know, Miss Horning doesn't like us, and, you know, some of us may or may not like her, but that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. What matters is that we want to try and help the people in that area. And, and that's, may it, please let me finish. Please, I've, I've been very, dis very respectful of you when you speak, and I'm not going to interrupt you, I promise. Please don't, please, please don't interrupt me, okay? That's just general politeness. Thank you. I'll continue. So, what I would like to see is, I would like to see us explore, I'd like to see our staff go and explore with some of these other entities, the prospect, and don't say this is Dale Perkins' idea or the ECUA's idea. Let somebody else take credit if they want to do it. It can be the mayor's idea, Senator Broxson's idea, a citizen's idea, whoever, you know, wants to take the ball and run with it and coordinate it. But I would like to see us try to establish a joint water protection task force because none of these entities are going to be able to solve this problem on our own. But working together, everybody working together, we may actually make a difference and make some progress. And so... You know, I, I don't know if that's something that we need to, you know, we need to put in a motion. I don't really think we do. I think it would be best to have staff kind of work, you know, proactively behind the scenes, see if there's some interest, and then develop that with the interested parties. But the truth is, as much as I want to help and as much as any member on this board wants to help, we're not going to be able to solve the problem alone. And I'll do everything I can, everything I can to help, you know, but... We're going to need a group effort, and I think it's, I think it's long overdue for us to, to be working together with these other entities. We've shown we can do it. I mean, our relationship with the county has gotten much better. We've done some projects with them. You know, I think everybody has the same goal. Everybody probably has the same frustration. So I would, I would like to see us look toward that and, and to be sure that we do our part, and if we find that we've got some deficiencies, make sure we just address them. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, well said, Mr. Perkins. Ms. Campbell. Well, to, to address Mr. Williams' questions, um, I think most of these issues predate 1981, which is when ECUA took over city and county uh, system. And then in 2012, they came up with a 16-year plan, which has been increased. The time has been increased now, but it's, it was a plan to address the issues of inflow and, and infiltration. So. As we harden our system with those $9 million a year, it actually puts a stronger burden on the private line because, you know, we don't have cracks and now the water has to go somewhere. It was going into our system. Now it's coming out into those systems. So to, to those cracks, which they might not have known the cracks were there prior. So that I was just trying to get a little com common sense um, discussion of it, of what happened. And so uh, that was number one. Number two, I wrote down the map. Uh, we, I had an old map, and Bruce uh, agreed last week to get that updated. And so maybe we could just give everybody a copy of it. But it has where the uh, septic tanks or areas without sewer are. And then it has also hatch mark the areas that are health hazard, which is nice. because. And I had it, I wanted it updated because I had it from my district, but I didn't have it for the new parts of District 1 that we just took over. So I asked for that. And then... Miss Campbell, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, uh, but sorry. Jen's then, not able to hear you. It's not picking up your voice at all okay, back there. Okay, sorry about that. And then number... Uh, the next thing was um, Kevin asked about, you know, what we could do. There are insurances that can help people on their side for failures to their systems. And we... We've talked with those before, but it's always the fear that we're pushing that insurance on someone, you know. I'm an insurance person, you know, so I believe in it. I have insurance on everything I own, but, but you know, we don't want to push that on to the public. But that is, that is one thing that, that we could talk about. And then I love that somebody brought up joint water task protection for, force because that is something, Dale, that we talked about in these meetings was some type of task force for stormwater and septic to sewer. So um, I'm glad to know that 
you're interested in that and um because they're going to be looking for someone on and they didn't talk about who on what part yet but they did talk about it and there was somebody um, at that meeting from the board of county commissioners so i think everybody they have just as much interest in stormwater as we do septic to sewer so i i think that's a grand idea and i, I think that's something that group of people is already thinking about and I think maybe with with Bruce Beach coming up, the city would be motivated to do that. And uh, you know, it's less of a county issue with with Bruce Beach and more of a city. But it seems to me that's that's an opportunity for them to take a leadership in in, in this and uh, for us to participate. Yeah, um, we should make sure someone from the city is invited to that. Yeah. That's fine. Mr. Perkins. Well, and the county may have some interest as well. I mean. Carpenter's Creek is a prime example that goes through three, you know, county districts and and, and the big, you know, big problem is, is funds, you know, I know the city has challenges. I mean, they increased our stormwater fee, which, you know, is for good things. But, you know, I live on Carpenter's Creek. I've got a storm drain that comes down. It's eating my yard away. It's eating my neighbor's yard away. And three great big giant pine trees are leaning over about to fall on our houses. One has fell on my my uh, neighbor's house this last big storm he got one through his roof but you know i've had the city engineers out there they've looked at it and said oh yeah it shouldn't be designed like that it's eating things away but they haven't done anything about it and i, I suspect it's probably related to money you know to, to lack of money and i'm hoping that um i'm hoping that that they can get issues addressed not only down at bruce beach but throughout throughout the city and throughout the county that's why i think the task force would be helpful you know, and, and as far as membership, I wouldn't pretend to have the best knowledge on membership, but, you know, I think someone from the us, the public sewer system, the private people, the stormwater system, the health department for septic tanks, DEP, um, and a, an affected citizen member. I think, you know, that, that'd be pretty basic. I'm, sh you know, I'm not saying who should be on it, but in our consultant consultations with these other people say, hey, there's a lot of people that could play a role here. It could be about a seven a seven member committee or so the various areas of responsibility and expertise that would make sense thank you mr perkins uh, miss campbell I, I believe some of those were the names that were mentioned uh, robert bender was there from the city i mean from the um yeah. county but um and also they had the estuary Rita bay uh mm -hmm. pensacola bay estuary folks were were there last time so and you know i would love to see if you we research like the whole state of Florida and the whole state of Alabama and other counties you see on the tax bill, stormwater and um, septic issues. You know, you don't see it here, any use for MSBU, but you, I mean, you see it like at, in, in Rarity Island, but you see a lot more of that um, throughout the rest of the state. And then uh, one last thing on the library, that was a, um, that's a newer library. That was a contractor issue. And it was found by a citizen. Okay, thank you for good discussion, board members. Um, I see no more speakers. I will move. Uh, Ms. Horning, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll leave you on open forum, if, if that's okay, where, that's where we have you. Um, I, I think we will all remember this discussion going into that. Uh, the next item is new bi business, and we had requested budget discussion. Uh, I think Mr. Mr. Stevens is the one who brought that up, so you're recognized. Uh, put your speaker button on, sure. if you will. So, so, and this is just more of a statement versus a discussion. You know, we, you know, just just kind of uh, recapping, and I had a chance to digest our marathon CAC meeting um, last week when we were going over the budget. And thanks, you know, to Justin and the other uh, staff members and, and um, department heads for giving us a very thorough, <coughs> lengthy, detailed, um, uh, detailed discussion. You know, it, and it kind of leads me into to this week. I've been going over my with, with, in my company the, the budget, the PNL balance sheets, debt flow schedules, uh, balance sheets, and so forth. And I'm looking at ours, um, ECUAs, and I'm looking at um, at some of the um, department head recommendations on increases for 2023. I'm looking at um, projected fuel costs, oil, you know, lubricants, and so forth. And, 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 of course, we're up here, you know, talking about how can we save money, how can we, you know, and, of course, we're all, we're all looking for that. Um, I don't, see, you know, 
as I see it going forward, we're going to have some, this, this board is going to have some tough decisions to make. We're going to be discussing either rate increases or reduction in services, one of the two. Because as I look at this budget, I think you, you all are, have been very conservative, Justin, um, very conservative. Because, um, I mean, with fuel uh, increases at, at 40 plus percent, oil lubricants, PVCs, conduit, um, our power bill, um, as Mr. Woody brought, uh, brought up, has gone up, what, what 50%? Um, uh, increase from, from from FPL and doesn't I, I'm not holding my breath on it getting lower I certainly don't look with what's going on in Europe right now and the other uh, uh, um, issues going on in the world they're driving up oil prices and demand um, supply chain shortages I, I, I don't I don't look to dissipate at all in fact that's why I'm kind of wondering why how we're coming up with some of these um, projected increases I, I, I think um, I think the department heads have been very like reserved about asking us for too much um, because, because the reality is I, I'd like to have like a real legitimate number. Um, and I understand it's a moving ball, but, um, but I'm dealing with my suppliers on a daily basis and I buy some of the identical same products and services that we use here at ECUA. And I know what my suppliers are telling me, um, stand by for another rate increase, for example, in July. And, um, so, uh, and, and then, and we're sitting here even today. Um, going over renewing contracts with long-term vendors and so forth that are increasing um, their price. So this was the price they told us it was going to be. And again, I don't think that they're I don't think they're playing any games with their budget. They're, they're the private sector. I get it. Their their prices are going up, so therefore our price is going up. And so I just uh, I just this is just just as one of those sounding the proverbial alarm or just getting us. to, I know we're going to be talking about the budget uh, in the weeks and the months to come, but. Um, um, I've got vast experience at looking at financials, so I just welcome anyone to, to show me, because I'm looking for savings here. I'm looking for where we can cut, and at the opposite. Uh, in fact, not only am I not seeing additional areas where to, where to save money, and I know our standard ones we're doing, I'm just looking. I don't know if this budget that I, that we, that I get was a preliminary, um, but I don't know if that's going to be accurate. And, and I just go on the record of saying I project we're going to be spending more than what our department heads have projected um, and I'm doing, and I'm basing that on experience, on me being out there right now, dealing with these suppliers, dealing with these fuel companies, um, and we're doing projections on what we're going to be spending. And um, in labor, I think we've just hit the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, unfortunately, automation is not going to be in in my time. Uh, maybe, perhaps, um, I, I, I won't be here anymore. Um, ECA most likely. Um, the time we're going to have trucks or any or automation that's even going to offset that. Um, uh, in, in the least bit. So I, I just think we definitely need to be discussing it. We need to be realistic about it um, and start looking at forecasting some of these um, labor shortages, which are going to increase. Our pay is going to have to increase, um, like, like I said, in order to, to not only retain, but uh, get, uh, get, you know, attract additional individuals. Because I don't want to get any calls, any more calls than I already get on missed garbage pickups or us having to send out news blast on our pickups have been delayed due to shortages and drivers. And uh, again, I think we need to get ahead of this thing. Um, I'm very happy that um, Director Woody has pr has presented the. I'm more than ha I was more than happy to be a yes on that just just a, about 30 minutes ago on the uh, two dollars. Um, but 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 that's coming out of the existing budget, and it's the surplus from open positions, probably those 65. So that's not realistic. So we've got 65 positions. Um, which were a part of that money came from um, that need to be filled to adequately serve our residents. And so once those get filled, we're already looking at a deficit. So we're already going into projecting when those 65 get filled, we're not going to have it. So I'm just preparing, you know, as, as the uh, Game of Thrones winter is coming, um, that we're going to be, we're going to have to have some tough discussions about about services and or uh, increases. And then in conclusion, I have constant conversations with various residents like my fellow board members do and, and complain about the, I still get comments on the last rate increase. And I mean, are you yelling at FPL? Are you yelling at Publix, Winn-Dixie, BP? Because that, that is the cold, hard reality. I mean, we're facing rate increases in the private sector across the board. Um, so I, I, I constantly remind people, as, as when um, Director Woody comes with me to, to community meetings and so forth, we are not private. We are publicly owned, and it's amazing how many people don't understand the concept that we are a not-for-profit company. So it's like, guys, we're not trying to – I run profit companies. I'm all about it. But this is, this is a not-for-profit one here. So um, anyway, I just, I just wanted more than a discussion. It was just simply to say 
um, we're going to have some, some, some tough choices to make, and I hope we're all realistic about it and, um, and do our, our fact-checking and due diligence. And the interesting thing about it is we all have our own little business, our houses, our personal finances to run, and I think we're seeing increases with that, and we're going to be having repair form um, as a board. So thank you. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. The alarm having been sounded. Ms. Campbell, you are recognized. All right. Well, I can't let it end on a sad note like that, so I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the good things that um, that might keep us not at quite as high as you think. Uh, one thing that is for sure is we have a lot of increased customer base, and they are all paying us. So that was one thing that kind of is going to offset some of the additional expenses that we're going to have. We also, you know, we have good reserves. We we need to redo some of our debt, I believe, before the interest rates go crazy. Um, they're already going crazy. Uh, automation, yeah, right, too late. Failed. Automation, we are working on automation. I mean, just think some of the things that we've done with the robots at the MRF and uh, the new arms for the trucks, you know, and, and some other things that are really help, helping that. And then commend staff for health care. Our health care costs are doing a lot better because of um, what Kim and her staff are doing. God, everybody always talks about how loud I am. So, but I just, I just think there is some good news there too that we have, uh, you know, increased customer base. We have some reserves. We did have some leftover from last money from last year. Uh, automation, we're working on it with the the robots at the MRF and some arms on the trucks and what have you. And then the health care costs were kept at a very, very low. And we just really have to thank our HR department for that. So they're doing a good job with our health cares. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. And I see no more speakers on this subject. Um, we come now to board communications. And I don't believe that the intent was... Are there any things to come before us under board communications? No. Okay. Then we'll come to the open forum. Um, and I believe we have another, another public speaker. Uh, Ms. Horning, have you filled out another pink slip? No, ma'am, but I will. Thank you. then but y'all do as you please um y'all went all over the place all over the place you did not address the tan yard and me and my neighbors coming here for years and i have all the emails i have sent to the chair it's a problem that we too long we have not addressed. This report, the city, not y'all, the city stepped up. The city stepped up to find out what's going on. And I can show you, and tomorrow I'm taking the new public works director out on a walking tour. I can show you every sewer cover that blows. Every one of them. And I have pictures of every one of them. And video of every one of them. Now, when I first moved into the community, there weren't all these homes. But there was still all this crap. But I couldn't get anybody to address it. Y'all blamed the city. The city blamed you. And that went on and on and on until finally a city council person stepped up to look into what I was saying because I'm a scientist that if Sanders Beach is polluted, Bruce Beach has to be polluted. And that's when I gave the numbers to the Department of Health so they put it on their Fresh Beaches page, 
the intercaucus, once a week. The lowest it's been at Bruce Beach is 400. See, y'all keep going around. I know how they clean up things. I know what's going on with sewer connection. That's not a problem in the tan yard. We've surveyed. The tan yard neighborhood association surveyed. None of our homes are on septic tanks. I've been working on this problem for a long time. Our representative hasn't. And Mr. Woody, truly, I'm going to give you the report. It was 100% human. She couldn't even find bird. So, I mean, that's how, and, and we got a second report coming. So, it's sewage. And I've got a great idea of where it's coming from. And Mr. Perkins, I don't care. I have no feelings for you, but I tell you that Zeus, I'm mean, not Zeus, Roos and Zaragoza skyrocket. Uh, Chappie Hill, I mean, uh, Chappie James, skyrocket. South of Villers in government, skyrocket. Coming off the properties on South of Villers, Crazy numbers. So all that little talk that y'all did, whatever, I, I appreciate Mr. Williams addressing it directly and not going around the world as y'all did. This is what's happening. The city has stepped up. There was at least one member of this board, and I believe Mr. Woody was at the very first meeting. So this isn't new, Mr. Perkins. It's not new. And that was last year, August of last year. So y'all have sat on it this long. You know, come out and swim. Come out and walk. Hey, next time you go to a ball game, walk through old stinky field. Take your children, your dogs, because all that property is full of entercaucus. Chairman Vincent, uh, Dr. Horning, before before you, I just had a, a, a question for you. So, do you, what, in your opinion, where do you think a vast majority of it is coming from? Well, um, the way I'm seeing the map, when the government district was built, okay, what they did is they just mowed down the homes. All right, my home is 1918, and they mowed all them down. You know, it sort of reminds me of South Africa and Johannesburg. You know, they went to work one day and they came home and their house wasn't there. When about seven years ago, the FDLE is moving from Palafox. And they were hoping to build at the Chappie James building, that big green area that's there. Okay? Trees came down and that wasn't very good because they were huge heritage jokes. But when they started digging they ran into all the homes that they bulldozed down and then put dirt on top. I'll bet those sewer septic tanks are still in there. So they're percolating up out of the ground. And that's how we're getting it on our, our properties and our grasses and things like that. I mean, it just runs. So you think it's old? Septic tanks. I, I think that's one of the issues, yes. And we've got 18 homes going up right at Zaragoza and Roos. Boy, those people are paying big dollars. First time they have to walk out and step in, you know what? They're not going to be happy. And, and, and not to, you know, point the finger. So, so you know, back then, and, and we're talking, you know, probably 30, 40 Plus years ago, a lot of the oh, septic no, tanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Even more to my point, you know, septic yeah. tanks didn't. A lot of them didn't have bottoms to them. Right. So you had the drain filled. Um, so that would have, I would assume, would dissipated decades ago. Any residual sewage that may have been in those that was that, that was gone. I mean, it just, by the very nature of a of an existing well working septic system with the drain fills. But 
I, and again, I'm trying to work on solutions. You don't want to come back up here seven years from now and talk about the same thing. I'm just not, if that is in fact the the cause of it, which I which which or, or maybe spot. a small cause or, or something. And, and again, I'm somewhat familiar with septic systems and how they work. Um, right, I know you are. <laughs> but uh, so, I, but but aside from that, I'm not sure how to, if that was the main reason. I don't think it is. No. Uh, to your point, one reason how. East UA would address that. Like, how how would you come back after the fact and and address? Well, I think and, have because they have to be abandoned properly. I'm assuming. See, typically when they when you abandon a septic tank, it's crushed, filled in, and and, and, <coughs> and so yeah. forth. So I, I don't. And again, I can't go back to whenever these were done and if were there a permit pulled and were they abandoned properly. But but right. um, I, I mean, I, I'm thinking I'm leaning more towards what Mr. Woody was saying. And again, I've looked at some of these. We, we, we get we get. Uh, customers in here all the time, um, even complaining about they've, they've pulled permits for for laterals or whatever they don't even exist. And, and again, as you know, we've 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 owned this since the early '80s, um, so it was it was way prior to us. And it's certainly not pointing fingers, but we don't know where all these are. We're, we're dealing with with tile pipes and things of that nature. You know, Ms. Campbell, you brought up a good point when you I didn't think about that, but but knowing about pressure, you know, when you, when you're fixing all these main lines and we're relining these, it's kind of a cool product. If you ever seen it, it's this little rubber. Yeah, I've goes watched in the guys. Lines that, yeah, it's it's, it's a, a it's when y'all did a street going into it's Joe a neat Paddy's. product, but that's going to cause substantial pressure on the residential side. And so when you when you when you're saying to me, and, and I know I'm going, I'm down there for Mardi Gras. I know where you live and and, and the streets and stuff. And and when it floods, it's a mess. Um, but uh, that, that when you say it's coming from from the the, the, the residential um, um, homes and yards, and then just kind of flowing down no, no, in, into the streets. I think one of the areas that it might be is on the federal property where they were going to put FDLE and all those homes that they crushed. Now I don't know what they did with the other homes they crushed where the Chappie James building is. Right. I don't know if they're still under there, but that's one. You know, we're still playing sooth, you know, trying to find it. Yeah, and, I, I, and we're yeah talking, I'm just trying to look for, for, for solutions because that, because us realigning those, that is going to cause a tremendous amount of pressure on the residential's end lateral. So if you've got the same, because obviously the main was put in pretty close or, or along the same times as that lateral moving up to the residential house, and now we're realigning and repairing all those, but we're not fixing, which I know we can't fix the residential one, that's going to cause, if there was a, a leak, crack, um, degradation in the line, it's going to exacerbate that um, right. even more so. Uh, and but, not septic, sewer. Okay, right. But you need to see the picture, okay? So you have Chappie James. It's up here, mm -hmm. okay? When it rains and it comes down here, the first source of stormwater is right there on uh, roofs. Numbers are very high and it's always full of trash. Um, and I call them out to vacuum them all the time. There's only three more houses. And then there's a huge field where 13 homes are going in. And coming across that field is where we're getting numbers where it's, you know, sort of pooling um, and they're taking samples. That's where we're getting the surface sewage. Yeah, I would think we could do some soil samples, not us, but by one of those, we could do some soil samples on, on, on the areas you think that it may be coming from pretty easy to see if we've got active sewage under there. So we can eliminate, I'm all about eliminating variables. So you can eliminate that Maybe variable, and I'm up. thinking you could eliminate that variable pretty easy by saying if that's what, what, what you, you believe, and again, I know we're, we, we, don't, we don't have a definitive here, we're no. just trying to get solutions, but that would be an easy variable to eliminate, is to go there and do some samples in that area down and see where these existing, not existing, but previous septic tanks or whatever were and see if we're getting an absorbent amount of sewage in that soil. And if that's not it, oh, then we well, can cross that one off and then move on to maybe <laughs> stormwater drains or yeah. laterals or something along those lines. I agree. Thank you, Mr. Uh, tests need to be done. Um, and the city stepped up after I've come here, I don't know how many times, but we have an environmental crisis. And Ms. we're Ms. talking Community Maritime Park. Ms. Campbell, and I'm gonna go back and add, think about Washerman's Creek. It runs from north of, north of uh, Garden Street 
all the way down, right underneath the Chappie James, right right underneath the close state, yeah. right underneath the state park, crosses over the street where before it gets to your house, then it goes out into that ECUA, and then empties out in, in the bay. So you've got a you've got a creek buried. It's like burying a river underneath. So, and if there's cracks in those pipes, and then you got water going down when you have rain and it fills up, all the pipes fill up. If there's cracks in any of the stormwater pipes, then it's got to be coming back out. That's so somewhere. Yeah. And, and, and that's the perfect storm. We've got right. Washerwoman's Creek coming up because it's raining. Mm -hmm. Storm water trying to get into stormwater drains and high tide coming in. Yep. Well, and, and on top of that, we've repaired our mains, which has raised the water right. table where it used to just infiltrate into our, our mains. That's also raised the water table. Well, I can tell you, you don't have to do any soil samples around that area <laughs> to see if there's sewage in it. I, I'm, I metal detect and dig antique bottles, and I've been fortunate enough to have some friends that live around there. And I've dug there, and there's a sewage smell when you dig there, and the, mm -hmm. the dirt is is black, muddy, and sewagey. I yeah. mean, it's it's thick, it's not wet, but it's it's there, you know. And um, I don't know where it's coming from, but it 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 is there, and it's something, you know. And I think a lot of people think we have a lot more authority than we do. I mean, I don't know that we can go out all over the place and do soil sampling and and DEP type stuff. I mean. Maybe, maybe we can, but I think we can't work with these. Uh, I think we can't work with these other entities to uh, to get something done on it. Yeah, the the final and last report will be, um, I think, in a month because we're still waiting for the other sample to come back. But this is what the city's done. I'm finally getting somewhere. I hope you'll jump on board and see where it's coming. I can show you all the manhole covers that are ECUA that will blow even with one inch of rain. Okay. Because you can see them. When they're underwater, who, who said, you know, you can't see them, they're underwater? We can see the bubbling. And I've got ones that took the lid right off. So you got the, the pictures and the data. Thank you. I wanted to just say thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Horning for, 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 for coming in and, and for the record I, I like you so I just want to throw that out there uh, not a yes ma'am I, I you're very welcome have a blessed day okay I see nothing else coming before us it, uh, we are adjourned Oops. do you want to know how many emails she I don't think I got out of that I don't know how many